All right, here we go, folks. Okay, welcome everybody. I hope yeah. everyone had a lovely uh, Pesach and we're ready to move through the Omer. Let's see, I guess our screen will be lighting up any moment there. There we go. Okay. And um, we are going to uh, start off with a few minutes of Kuzari today and then we'll launch right into Parshat Kedoshim. Okay, so uh, let's just uh, remember where we were. Um, a topic that is somewhat more esoteric than what we're used to, which is the topic of, uh, someone have their phone? Uh, so top, the topic is Sefer Yitzirat, the book of creation. Now, as we mentioned before we broke for the holiday, the book of creation is a very ancient work, um, and it uh, is attributed back to Adam, that God taught this, these ideas to Adam Harishon, and then Avraham Avinu was able to infer them through his in analysis of the universe, and this was later transcribed by Rabbi Akiva. Okay, that's according to legend. Um, it was most likely composed in the form that we have today, in the Gaonic period, somewhere between seventh and ninth centuries um it is it has many um undertones of what we would call neoplatonist principles and also proto-kabbalistic principles that term proto-kabbalah is like before the zohar manifested there were many uh, pre-zohar works that are called proto-kabbalah because like they're sort of pre-kabbalah kabbalah and Sefer Yitzira is one of those works. Um, it describes in very um, cryptic manner how Hashem fashioned all of reality from the, 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 the ingredients that really boil down to the letters of the Aleph Bet and other base ingredients that Hashem used in order to create our world. I'm just going to mute everybody so that we don't get any of the background noise. And there we go. Okay, so that's that's what, what, what we were talking about. So we're going to now uh, dip a, a, our toe into the water of Sefer Yitzira, just so that you get a basic idea of what kind of stuff is contained therein. And for that purpose, I'm just going to display on the screen the first Mishnah, of Sefer Yitzira, just the first Mishnah, okay? Um, and I'm going to share it on the screen up on top. And I hope everybody can see it. It's not something that we sent out in advance of this year because it's just this very small text. Okay, does everyone see the? Everyone see it? Let me make sure it's it's it, it should be quite visible to you. Um, Mishnah Aleph or Perak Rishon, there's, it's really not clear how you classify these paragraphs. I also want to make sure make sure you understand that there are so many variant Yirsaot, so many variant versions of Sefer Yitzira, because the more um, unknown or the I should say the less studied the text the more variant texts we discover since it, it because it, it's not, it's not, doesn't have uniformity because it's being passed down among small enclaves of mystics. And so you sometimes get words missing, added words and so forth. Okay, <clears throat> so the very first Mishnah is Bishloshim Ushtayim Nitivot Piliot Chochma with 32 Wondrous and wise pathways, Chakak Yudhei Havaya Tzivakot Elokei Yisrael Elokim Chaim. With these thirty-two path, wondrous pathways of wisdom, the Almighty, using using very di uh, various different names of Hashem, um, was able to engrave. And then we go into other words uh, that describe Hashem: Melech Olam, the King of the World; Kel Shakai 
the all-capable God, Rachum v'chanun, merciful and benevolent, Ram v'nisa, exalted and elevated, Shochen ad Marom, who dwells up high, the Kadosh whose name is sanctified, Marom the Kadosh, who elevate, etc., etc. So it is with these 32 pathways, Bara'et Olamo, God created his world. In other words, all of existence. Using Bishlosha Sefarim, with three, how would you translate Sefarim? Books, that's how you would normally translate books, but that's exactly not what it means. With three Samech Pei Reishes. That's what it means. With three Samech Pei Reishes, the Sefar, the Sipur, the Sefer. So there's an actual manipulation um, of the three-letter system of the Alephbet that runs throughout Sefer Yitzira. Okay? Now, the question that you should be asking is, what are these 32 pathways? Which is not actually, is not going to be undertaken by Rabbi Huda Halevi at this point. He's actually going to only start with these three words, Sfar, Sipur, and Sefer, which we're going to get into in the text of the Kuzari in just a moment. Now, um, before we answer that question, let me just review why Rabbi Yehuda Halevi wants to introduce us to Sefer Yitzira. Remember, and we discussed this uh, uh, before, before Pesach also, Rabbi Yehuda Halevi very much believes that all wisdom that a human being needs uh, uh, to live their life with fulfillment and with wisdom and with an enhanced knowledge can be gained through the corpus of Torah literature. In that sense, he's an anti-philosopher. You don't need to study science and philosophy of the secular world in order to gain a knowledge of Hashem and his universe, because there is so much that is rich that is contained with our own heritage. That really has been the undercurrent of his whole presentation of Sefer Yitzira. Because remember, the king had said to the rabbi, you know, I see that the philosophers have a tremendous amount of wisdom. And Rabbi Yehuda Halevi's response is, well, number one, they got it all from us, number one, uh, going dating back to the times of King Solomon. And, and number two, we have so much already that's contained that is not well known because it's really maintained by the wise men, which are very small in number among our people. But nonetheless, we have a bunch of stuff. And that's the whole reason why he introduces Sefer Yitzira. And so it's a very Judeo-centric, very uh, a proud Jew kind of point of view that when you look into our texts, you will find all you need to know. Truth of the matter is that there is a tremendous amount of intersection between Kabbalah and Neoplatonist philosophy. Um, because Neoplatonism is the philosophy that was well known to Maimonides and to Rabbi Huda Halevi, which when incorporated with Aristotelianism, tries to describe a universe that is a top-down universe that works with a divine being up high, who through a series of emanations influences and gives rise to all of existence as we know it. And the philosophy of Neo ne Neoplatonism in particular it, it devotes itself to describing how a supremely divine and perfect being is able through a series of filters to bring down his emanations into our world. And we see sort of like a pale uh, reflection of the essence of God in our world. It's imperfect because it's been filtered through a series of filters. And that's really, that's a, a philosophical system that predates the Zohar. But what is the Zohar? What's one of the, the, the sort of the, um, uh, what would you say, the uh, the foundational ideas of the Zohar and of, of medieval Kabbalah is this idea of the Sefirot, of the spheres, the, the spheres and the, the Sulam and the ladder uh, that, goes up and down, connecting heaven and earth. Um, and this whole idea of a series of celestial um, 
barriers between God and our world. And that's also Neoplatonism, but just packaged very, very differently. So what we're seeing in Rebbe Huda Halevi, who long, lives long before the Zohar is ever published, the Zohar is not published until the 1300s, some 200 years after Rebbe Huda Halevi. Had he had the Zohar at his disposal, instead of quoting from the Sefer Yitzirah, he would have quoted from the Zohar. Okay? One of the reasons that some of the scholars suggest that the Rambam never quotes Rebbe Huda Halevi by name is that Rebbe Huda Halevi was a proto-Kabbalist and the Rambam was anti-Kabbalah. He felt that a more, a more accurate depiction of the cosmos and the way that God interacts with our universe could be found in Aristotle instead of looking at some of these proto-Kabbalistic texts. So just by way of introduction, why we're, why we're studying this in the first place, okay? So let, let's get back to our question. What does 32 mean to you? Any, any idea? Well, Mother's Day is coming up. That should be very significant to the number 32. Why? Lave, right? So what, uh, lave uh, is heart. So there could be a connection there. Um, but what Rabbi Sajigon and many of the other commentaries say is that 32 is 10, the 10 sefirot of Kabbalah, and the 22 letters of the Aleph Bet added together. And those are the 32 ingredients that God used in order to create the universe. Okay? So far, so good. Everyone with me? Now, what Rabbi Yehuda Levi is going to be talking about in his introduction, in the very first opening discussion of Sefer Yitzirah, is, uh, let's take a look. We're now on page 452. Um, so just let's start again. Actually, we'll start on the bottom of page 451. The rabbi said, one of our works is Sefer Yitzirah, the book of creation by Avraham, our patriarch. It is very deep and its commentary is quite lengthy. It instructs us about God's dominion and unity as he presides over creations, which on the one hand are disparate and varied, but which on the other hand are unified and harmonious. Their harmony stems from the one who has organized them. So God is completely unitary. That's a basic tenet of our faith. And we also discover some level of unitariness when we look at our universe from a particular vantage point. We see variety, we see multiplicity and disparity within our, within our world. In other words, there are, and the elements are opposing each other. You have certain elements that, like air and fire, which are light, and other elements like water and earth, which are heavy. You see um, uh, things that are dark and things that are light. You see, you see different kinds of animals. You see different kinds of aquatic creatures. You see different kinds of flora and plant life. There seems to be so much diversity. And yet, there seems to also be an ecosystem which has some level of unity uh, that binds everything together. And unity emanates from Hashem who is completely unitary. Already, you're seeing that Rebbe Huda Halevi is utilizing nomenclature that is familiar to a Neoplatonist whose whole project is to explain how the absolute unity of God filters itself to the diversity that we discover in our world. Okay? Now, with that in mind, Let's take a look at the first teaching that he brings us from Sefer Yitzira. One of the teachings is Sefar, Sipur, and Sefer. Mental inventory, verbal instruction, and physical inscription. Now, not every one of the commentaries to Sefer Yitzira understands it the way that Rabbi Huda Halevi does. And one of the benefits that we get from studying the Kuzari is to see a very early commentary on Sefer Yitzirah, telling us 
the simplest and very straightforward. You don't have to be a mekubal, um, you don't have to be a Kabbalist to understand the ideas that Rabbi Yehuda Halevi presents to us from the Sefer Yitzira. They're very basic, and he tries to give us an understanding of these ideas that doesn't require you to know numerology and doesn't require you to know a lot of the ideas that are contained within the Sephirotic system as described by the Kabbalists. But what do these letters mean? There are three letters, Samich, Pe, and Resh, that are all the same, but when, but when you put in the vowels differently, you get three different variations of the same concept that go into creation. So remember, what, what we're trying to do is to show that from unity comes diversity and multiplicity. Here's a perfect example. Samech Pei Resh, the exact same three letters, unified, but then they diversify as you add vowels to them. That's really a model for the way that creation works. God is unitary, and the diversity comes as the vowels are added to the different components of creation, which is how we get diversity. Okay. Now, what are the three specifics? Sefar, mental inventory, refers to the measuring and weighing of the physical creations. In order for a physical body to be properly organized and arranged so that it can fulfill its purpose in creation, the correct number, amount, volume, and weight must be calculated for it. The properties of motion, musical arrangements, and so on, all these things must be done with an inventory. That's what the word sapphire means, to, to count. To be, how do you say a number in, in Hebrew? Mispar. And how do you say to count in Hebrew? Lispor. So the shoresh is samach pe resh. So that's what it means by God making a mental inventory. The first step of creation was Samach Peresh, but to be to, to make an inventory and to count and to calculate. Okay? This is the same thing that any builder does. He will not create a house before first imagining it in his mind. The next way to use the same three letters, Samach Peresh, is through Sipur. And what is a sipur? A story. What's the connection between counting and a story? We even have this in English. To count is to take is to go through a group of numbers: one, two, three, four, five, six. To recount is to do what? Is to relate something that happened. So even in English, we have the same reverberation of the same word used in a different way. So, and this is really all, there's a lot of Kabbalah in the Sefer Yitzira that revolves around um, letter and word manipulation. Because language in itself is a construct that God created to enable us to take something that starts as a unitary body and manipulate it to mean multiple different things, all of which are related to each other. So, sipur, is verbal instruction, refers to speech and voice, not the kind we associate with mortals, but rather with divine speech and the voice of the living God. This speech contains the constitution and the form of the object being described according to God's will. For example, it says, God said, let there be light, and there was light, let there be a firmament, and so forth. The production of the object was thus simultaneous with the verbal instruction. So this is the second step in creation. The first step was Sefer, God thinking about what he wanted to create before he created it, calculating how everything would be structured, including the laws of physics, how many elements, um, the, the rules of gravity, thermodynamics, and so forth. All of that was calculated by Hashem, how this world was going to function. And then God spoke, God was, was misaper, instead of being so fair, he was misaper, which means he related or spoke, and that gave rise to existence, okay? And that's the second step 
of creation. And finally, we have the third step of creation, which is Sefer. A Sefer is what? It's a book, okay? Which means that you can use this words, the letters Samech Peresh, to talk about verbal relation, and you can also use it in terms of inscription, writing something down in a book, okay? So well, how, does, how do those letters relate, and how does that relate to creation? And divine writing is the creations themselves. Once the creations are existent, that is God's book. So uh, even it says in, um, uh, in the Torah itself, Zesefer toldot Adam. This is the chronicle of the generations of man. One way of understanding that, the simplest way of understanding that, that's from Genesis chapter six, I believe, is that it just means the following is a list of all of the chronicles up from Adam down to Noah. But Zes Sefer Toldot Adam means also, according to Sefer Yitzirah, that this is the product of God's speech when he said, let there be. And this is what happened as a result of God speaking, let there be, the Sefer comes into existence. What is the Sefer? All of physical reality. Okay? All three are interrelated as divine speech is his writing and divine measurement is his speech. Our sages tell us that there is a machloket between two great sages, Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi Yehoshua, as to when the world was created. According to Rabbi Yehoshua, the world was created on Rosh Chodesh. Yes. Nisan. According to Rabbi Eliezer, the world was created on Rosh Chodesh. Tishrei. How do we paskin? We go according, to, for some, in some respects, we go according to Rabbi Eliezer. Because on Rosh Hashanah, what do we say? Hayom. Harat Olam. Today is the birthday of the world. But at the same time, we also acknowledge that Nisan is also the commemoration of the first day of creation because there's a practice called Birkat Hachama, the blessing on the new sun, which happens every 28 years. Remember the last time it was? It's about 15 years ago. Um, but we're about halfway through the, the Birka Tachama cycle. Um, and um, it's the, I think it's the longest cycle that we go through in Jewish life, um, where we commemorate the position of the sun as it was from the, at the time of creation. And it always falls out at the beginning of what month? Nisan. Yeah, it's Rosh Chodesh Nisan. I think it's always Rosh Chodesh Nisan or shortly thereafter. So, or maybe it's the fourth of Nisan because it's, I don't remember exactly. Anyway, so which one is it? So this is the question that the Balei HaTosafot ask. They say, how can you tell me that the world has two dates of creation? And Tosafot answers the question by saying that they're both correct. Elu elu divrei elokim chayim. They both are the, the, the word of the living God. On Rosh Hashanah, God mentally did the the um did the safar was so fair that he made the mental calculation of all of creation and he only did the sipur the verbal instruction on rosh chodesh nisan so both are correct because both are vital components of creation so so as divine speech is his writing and divine measurement is his speech, it comes out then that Safar, Sipur, and Sefer are all one vis-a-vis -vis God, where the, whereas they are three distinct entities vis-a-vis -vis man. And this is where we're going to hold it for today because uh, I think our brains are about to explode. Um, so we want to make sure that no, one's, no one makes a mess here in the room with exploded brains. And so we will uh, we will hold it here, and we'll get into the parsha. Any any questions, comments? Okay. 
All right, let's get into the Parsha. Let me do another share of my, my screen. Okay, here we go. I want to I want to take us to the very beginning of Arshat Kedoshim. Um, by Daber Hashem al Moshe Lemor, God spoke to Moshe. Daber el Kol Adat bnei Israel, speak to the entire congregation of Israel. The Amar Ta Lehem Kedoshim Tihiu, and say to them, You shall be holy. Ki Kadosh Ani Hashem Elokechem, or I. Shem, your God, and holy. Now, we've talked about in the past the definition. We've tried to quantify the definition of holiness according to a number of our commentaries. What the consensus is that holiness means a, a, an elevation above one's own desires and wants and needs. Sanctification means that I deliberately um, um, divest from myself certain physical indulgences. And that's what the definition of holiness is uh, as a general rule, that I create divisions and allow myself to be separated from some of the things that I would normally indulge in if I was left completely to abandon and no self-control. So part of holiness is not overindulging, right? It just, uh, and I guess maybe this is an appropriate discussion to have after Pesach, after all the Pesach programs are finished, because you don't want to talk about this before Pesach, because then people are going to feel guilty when they go and to their uh, Pesach programs. Someone was just describing to me on Shabbos, they just come back from a, from a Pesach program, and they had described to me, it was just wonderful, they said the shiurim and the classes and the social programming, and then they talked about the food, and then, you know. For breakfast, there was a pancake station, a waffle station, and uh, an omelet station, this station and that station. And then there was a mid-morning break in the tea room. And there was this kind of slider and that kind of uh, pastry and this, da 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 And then there was lunch, the, and the, the carving station and that station and this station. And then we had a mid-afternoon snack in the tea room back again with this kind of uh, veal cutlet. <laughs> Yeah, you know what? Thank God. No, and actually, I just, I felt nauseated. I, you know, I felt to myself, how would I be, I, I wouldn't feel good about myself if I, if I was, you know, just to, just to be exposed to all of this. And, and the question is, would I have the discipline and the self-control to, to not just be, you know, say, listen, I paid so much money for this. I want to get my money's worth. You know, I want to make sure I'm getting uh, you know, I can't just nibble at this because look at everybody else, you know, everyone else is piling their plates up. So, um, so what is the definition of Kiddusha? What is the definition of holiness? It's again, it's very elusive, but one of the definitions is Kadesh Atzmecha B'Mutarlach. Sanctify yourself with those things, even when they're kosher and they're permissible. Make sure that you elevate yourself above just fulfilling whatever whim and desire you have. Okay, but Rashi tells us that there's something unique about the way that God phrased this command of be holy. And it is, Daber el kol adat b'nei Yisrael, v'lamed shenem raparshazu b'hakel. This teaches us that this commandment was given to the Jewish people specifically when they were gathered together. Now, the Jews were quite often gathered together in the desert, but there's something unique about this. Um, and as the Mizrahi, the commentary on Rashi, explains that the Talmud tells us that other times, um, and, um, and actually this is from the, uh, the other commentaries as well, that normally when Moshe gave these commandments, First, he would teach the commandment to his brother Aharon, and then he would Aharon would learn the commandment, and then he would call in the seventy elders and he would teach it to them, and then they would go ahead and disseminate the teaching, make sure that all of the different constituents of Klal Yisrael 
were properly educated about a specific teaching. In this instance, Moshe, and there are times, there's other times in the Torah where the Torah says that it should be done, the hakel, that it should be done with all of the populace assembled. For example, in Parshas Vayakhel, which we read just a few weeks ago, it says, Vayakhel Moshe et koladat b'nei so vayomer alihem, ele hadevarim asher tziva Hashem la'asot otam. Moshe gathers all of the Jewish people, and this is after the sin of the golden calf, there's a need to gather them together. He gives them the law of Shabbos before they are about to build the Mishkan. Okay? So that's one example. But here's another example, that it's done behakel. Um, and that's from the words el kol adat b'nei so, because you normally don't find those words. So, uh, and Rashi tells us, mitnei, why is that? Mitnei shorov gufei Torah tluyin ba. Because the majority of the gufei Torah, not gufi, but gufe. What does gufe mean? The bodies of. That's literally what it means, Shireen, right? Right? So gufe Torah, the the I guess maybe you'd say the essential parts of the Torah are contained in this section of you shall be holy. What are some examples of the essential parts of the Torah that are contained in um, this section of Kedoshim. Be'ahavta l'reyecha kamocha. Love your neighbor as yourself. And we know that Rabbi Akiva himself said, Zeklal gadol batorah. This is a great general rule of the Torah. And we know that Hillel told the person who was coming to convert while standing, while in order, if, it, in, if and only if he could learn the whole Torah while standing on one foot. So what did Hillel tell him? A, ver- a variant of the Haftalareacha Kamocha, which is my Dasani Allah Lechavrach Lotavid, what is hateful to you, do not do to your neighbor. Um, so Lotamod al Damreacha, do not stand idly by your brother's blood. So there are so many principles, not just specific mitzvot of what to do on Sukkot with a lulav, but general principles that frame the whole idea and the ideology writ large of the Torah, and that's why Moshe felt it was necessary to gather them all together at once. Now, what's the connection? Why is it necessary for everyone to be gathered together just because so many of the important principles of the Torah are, uh, are, are here? Why not just teach the people separately and make sure that everyone gets it? So the Mizrahi over here explains, he says, uh, I'm just jumping in into the middle of the text. It really is important for everyone to be together. Because there might come a time where one group of people who heard the law separately, if it, had, if it was taught to separate constituents, one group of constituents might say, what, what did Moshe say exactly on that one mitzvah? So then, Yihiyu ha'acherim mishivim lahem, then the other people would say that we're not part of their group or we're part of another group. Lo kach v'kach omar bifnecha. No, Moshe said it this way. And not the way that you're remembering, but he said it a different way. Aval im hayu nichnasim kata charkat, lo hayu yucholim anshe hakata chat lashiv anshe hakata cheret, lo kach v'kach omar lachem. Ibn shayu omrim lahem lo amar lanu kazem. He says, but if people were taught separately, you could have disputes as far as what Moshe actually said. But now that we're all together, th- this does not allow for any disagreement because the majority will say, this is what we heard Moshe say. And if you are, are remembering that he said something different, you're misremembering. There's, no pos- there's much less possibility for error. And so the Mizrahi's point is that when you're teaching something that's so essential about the Torah, there's much less margin of error that's possible. And you and you create a smaller margin of error by getting everyone together in the same room and hearing it all at once. Okay? So that's the argument that Rashi makes. But there's a, a variety of different opinions about this that I wanted to share with you, and I wanted to sort of create a um, an illustration of what I think would be very helpful for us to come out with about this idea that these particular mitzvot about being holy 
were given to the Jewish people as a community all together. So the first of all, the Rav Harovitz, the Panim Yafos of the 18th century, says as follows. Nira lefaresh alda al derech shamru b'shabat daf lamed aleph maase benochri gaireni al manat shetilamedeni kol hat Torah kula, and he says it's the same idea that Hillel told the convert, right? And like Rashi says, chaver chamamash kegon gezela ugneva niuf verov hamitzvot. He says that um, that. Don't do to your friend what you would not want to be done to you includes principles that are contained in our Parsha, like stealing and exploiting and committing adultery. And so many of those mitzvot. We've explained that the entire Torah, going back to say for Yitzira that we just learned about, is really all unitary. It comes from one source, as it says. Um, and, and so he said his, his basic point is that since the Torah is unitary and all of its themes are interconnected, in order for those themes to come across properly, it needs to be given to a unified people. In other words, the approach of the Panim Yafot is that the Torah is unitary thematically and it boils down to the idea of be holy. And all of the mitzvot that are subsumed in our parsha all have to do with the idea of being holy. And they can all be interwoven into one unitary whole. In order for that to be communicated successfully, it has to come from a unitary source to a unitary recipient. And the unitary recipient is all of Am Yisrael that everyone has to be together. Like we know, like it says in the in the Midrash, Ki'ish Echad Echad on Shavuos, that we all stand stood around Mount Sinai. When communicating ideas that are all interrelated and boil down to one central theme, they have to be given to one unitary recipient. Yes. Sure, of course. Oh, that's a great question. You have to think about that. The question is, why does it say Kedoshim in the plural and not Kadosh Tihia? It's altogether possible that um, there are def different working definitions of Kedusha within the, the one central theme of Kedusha. And so therefore, maybe what Moshe was conveying to the people is that for one person's Kedusha, his abstinence from one thing is going to be different from another person's abstinence from, from that other thing. For one person, it, may, it might have to do with one type of gratification and another person might have related to another. I don't know, but that's worth, it's worthwhile thinking about. The Korban Aharon, Another early Hasidic commentary says, "Im naami kaiyunu nedayek omro sherov gufei Torah velo amar sherov haTorah nomar bazelo fanachem." He says, "Let's take a look at the way the midrash quoted by Rashi talks about these primary principles. It doesn't say that the majority of the Torah ideology is rooted in the mitzvot contained in our parsha." but rather uses the term gufei Torah. Like Shireen, you said, it means the bodies of the Torah. And why use that word body? That's a very unusual term to use when you're talking about mitzvot. V'hu shekola parshiyot yesh mi gufa Torah, shuhu hapshat asher ba, v'hagemara asher ba me'at. He says, the answer to that question is, is that the words of Torah contain a body and contain a soul. What is the body of the words of the Torah, the mitzvot? The very simple, straightforward presentation of the mitzvah. This is what you should do, and this is what you should not do. Okay? And the way that the Gemara explains the performance of that mitzvah. 
שהם המושכלות וסודות החכמה והאלוקית והאלוקות הכמוסים בה הרבה. But then, hidden beneath the surface commandment is the neshama of the, of the mitzvot. The neshama of the mitzvot are those things that um, contain the themes and the deeper ideas and intentions that go into each and every mitzvah. And for, to, to learn the neshama of the Torah, Moshe had to teach that to st- separate groups of constituents because each and every group was on a different level of capacity to receive the neshama of the Torah. It's more than just the feeling. It's the... It's the it's it's the ideas that go into. In other words, two people could look at one mitzvah and say and and do it exactly the same, but one person has a surface understanding of it, and another person has a much deeper understanding. So let's just take our our classic example: shaking a lulav on sukkahs. So one person says, "Okay, four agricultural products from the Middle East." God says to shake them. Because you want to show that uh, 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 that you're part of the Israeli experience, so that's what I'm going to do. Okay. Another person takes those arbaminim and he interprets the lulav as representing the spine. He interprets the um, the esrog as representing the heart, and, and and then and that's the midrashic Jew, and then you have the kabbalistic Jew which takes a look at the sephirotic emanations and the frequencies of each and every one of those vegetations, how they're very, very different. So each person has a different depth. You know, we say shivim panim la Torah. There are 70 different facets to the Torah. Every, uh, there are multiple levels of complexity in every single divine communication. So that's what we call the nisham. The performative aspect of the mitzvah don't murder, don't steal, shake the lulav. That's common. That's the goof. That's, that's common to all of us. We all understand what we're supposed to do and what we're not supposed to do. But as far as the understanding and the depth of meaning to that particular mitzvah, uh, different types of people have different ways of understanding it. So when Moshe is teaching the neshama of the Torah to the people, he needs to teach it to separate groups dependent upon their capacity to appreciate what he's teaching. So he first teaches it to Aharon, who has the highest depth of understanding next to Moshe himself. And then he needs to teach it to the 70 elders who have the next level of of understanding. And then he goes on to the tribal heads. And then eventually that trickles down to all of the, the individual members of each tribe. But when he teaches the Gufei Torah, the Gufei Torah is where we're all, what we all share in common. Aval beparsha sheruba Gufei HaTorah, v'heim pshatei HaTorah. These are the things that we must do as, uh, that we have to have a uniform practice in. So v'heim pshatei HaTorah uvelimud pshatei HaTorah hakol shavim. There everyone is equal. V'hayu cholim lishmoa yachad. And everyone therefore can and should hear it all together. Then Neemar Lahem Bihiva Adam Yachad Uvahakel Kula. That's when it has to be done, everyone gathered together. You know, just think about our observance of halacha versus all the different approaches to Orthodox Judaism. You got your Hasidim, you got your Misnagdim, you've got your more modern, you've got your more uh, Haredi, and everyone's got a different approach to the way that they observe the Torah. The commonality is we perform the mitzvot. But there's so much variety within that, the difference between the guf and the nisham. In a sense, we could say, physically, we all share the same DNA, same number of chromosomes, same type of genetic structure, same skin, same, you know, more or less. We all have more in common in our gufim, in our bodies, than we do in our neshamas. The neshamas are extremely diverse and disparate. Next, let's go on to the Ma'or Vashemesh. 
He says, <clears throat> the Moor Shemesh tells us a very important idea. And that is that there are times when a person needs to be in solitude. And there are times when a person needs to be part of a community. And the principle that he wants to impart to us is that obviously it's sometimes healthy that if you're living within an unhealthy society, you need to flee from that society and go into solitude. And I think you and I can all relate to that. Um, the best suggestion for good mental health today is to turn off your social media and to forget about the craziness, the in absolute insanity that is transpiring around us everywhere um, if we allow ourselves to look at the world without filters. So, and I'm guilty of it just as much as the other guy is. There are times when I inappropriately allow myself to get absorbed in my social media feed about what's going on on the campus and what's going on with the talking heads and all of that other stuff. And it's very unhealthy. And at some point you gotta say, this is not good for me. It's not useful use of my time. And I've got to move forward and do something productive. And we got to see if we can figure out, perhaps be a part of a solution, but then move forward, not to indulge constantly in this stuff. But so there are times when isolation is appropriate, but what Hashem wanted to communicate to B'nai Israel when giving us these mitzvot is if you want to be a holy society, you have to do it together. You cannot achieve the ultimate level of Kedusha by living in solitude. You must do it as a community. This is many times counterintuitive because, and, and this is the point that some of the other commentaries make, consider for a moment the quality of your prayer when it's done in a, in a synagogue setting versus the quality of your prayer when it's done in solitude. Which one do you feel has the greater sincerity and um, very directed purpose? I'm just interested in getting your feedback. Where would you say you can achieve a greater kavana in your prayer? On Shabbos morning in shul or when you're davening Friday night by the candles? Where do you get your spiritual high? What do you think? Any, uh, any reason? Yes. Uh-huh. Okay, good. Your elevation comes through the music. Love it. I love that. Yeah. Anyone else? A lot of talking. Yeah. What else? Okay, so the reality is that there's truth to both. There's there, But there is an argument to be made that when I'm with a community of people, there are liable to be many ulterior motives in my performance because my performance of mitzvot might turn into a performative act instead of a devotional act when I'm in the presence of others. We're all self-conscious when we're in other people's presence about how I'm going to look and how I'm going to appear. And so there's one, on one level, a person may feel that if I'm really going to be holy and devote myself completely to Hashem, I'm probably better served doing that in private instead of doing it in public. But at the same time, we know that so many of our mitzvot are structured such that, especially for men, you can't say Kaddish without a minion. You have to, like the halacha obligates us to do things publicly um, with the recognition that spiritual energy also can be enhanced and increased through a community effort. Um, so that's really one of the objectives of why the Torah says over here, Daber el kol adat b'nei Yisrael. Speak to the entire congregation. Make sure that they understand that um, despite what some people might feel at any given time, that isolating myself from community could bring me to a higher level of Kedusha. It's not that way. And he concludes by saying, he says, 
quotes a very interesting midrash. It says, Kedoshim to you, you shall be holy. Then the midrash says, Yachol Kamoni. You might think that you could be as holy as me, says God. No. Talmulomar ki Kadosh Ani. I am holy, which means that it's to the exclusion of you. You will never reach my level of holiness. Kiddushati lamala mi Kiddushatchem. My holiness exceeds your holiness. Now that seems to be a nonsensical midrash when you think of it. Why does the midrash have to point out to us that even though you have the capacity to be holy, never think that you can be as holy as God? Now, doesn't that sound strange why the midrash has to make a point of saying that? Never think you can be as holy as Hashem. I mean, I know that there are people who think they're God, but that's not what we're talking about. Why does the Medrash have to have to make that observation? So Rav Kloinimus says, this more Vashemesh, he says that the whole idea here is that God achieves holiness in solitude, but a Jew can never reach ultimate holiness in solitude. You can reach great spiritual levels, but if you're looking for absolute Kedusha, then you have to be part of a community. You can never do it on, completely on your own as an island uh, uh, of one person. Yeah. Jury, you know, I was thinking about that too. Yeah, I know. I know. During during COVID, a lot of people, I think, I th and I think the reason for that, Roz, is because so many people forgot what it means to be devotional in solitude. Because for, for so many people, spending years on end associating tefillah with just going to shul, that's not right either. That needs an adjustment. And so what the COVID pandemic allowed people to do is to realize that you can connect to God in solitude too. And it's sometimes very important. I'm, I've actually said this publicly, some of you may remember, I said, long before the COVID pandemic, I said, if you go to, I'm speaking to the men, if you go to Minion every day, it might be a good idea to take off one day a month and to daven at home. And the reason for that is because when you go to shul every day and you allot yourself X number of minutes, let's say for Psuke de Zimro, that you're zipping through, trying to uh, stay uh, at the same speed as everybody else. And you're losing out on a lot of the um, great words of the psalmist and the great words of the prince. So take off an occasional day. And I think what was refreshing about COVID is that the, the, the people who never took that time off and never really understood what prayer was all about because they were just trying to keep pace with the shliach tzibur who has to finish davening in a half hour, they never really, never really had that opportunity. And the last idea that I'll mention is from the Shem Yishmuel, who says that with this idea that we've just been introduced to, that you need a community in order to achieve ultimate holiness, he says, Uvazeh yuvan inyan svirat ha'omer kodem shavuot. Now we can understand why we have svirat ha'omer, getting back to that three-letter word, samech e reish, the counting of the omer. Shekvar amarnu shalashon omer ukibutz hanifradim. He says, what does the word Omer mean? La'amer is to gather together. It's actually one of the, one of the 39 melachot of Shabbat is me'amer, me to gather together and make bundles on Shabbos. So Sfirat Omer is the counting of the bundling together of the Jewish people. Vuhu hit kalulut kol hakitot. It represents bringing together all of the disparate groups of the Jewish people because some are chesed and some are gvur, you know, all of the different, each night of the sphira has a different chesed should be gvura, gvura sheba chesed, all different kinds. It represents all different kinds of Jews. Some Jews are more gvura, some Jews are more chesed. Uvekibutz klo kal Yisrael yachdav azrak yicholim lekabel he'arat chag hashavuot bishlemut. It is only through going through a whole series of counts and realizing that we're bringing everything together and bundling it all together, that we can receive the true light of Shavuot, of Matan Torah, which is to be a mamlechet kohanim v'goy kadosh, a unified holy people. And that's the idea behind the sphira, what the period that we're going through right now.
is to come to the recognition that despite the benefits of individualism and the great uh, and unique entree that I as an individual have in my relationship with my creator, in order to achieve ultimate holiness, I can never forget about the idea of unification with the general community. Um, let's see. Yes, solitude. Exactly. Okay. Oh, un unless Debbie deliberately spelled that as silly too, but she wanted to tell us that solitude is silly. I'm not sure if that was intentional or not, but if it was, it's a good play on words. Okay. Anything else before we let you go for the day? Let me wish you all a great week and take care of everyone.